Welcome, I'm Janelle Kolaski, a career mindset coach and actor. And I'm Amanda Duvall, a self-authenticity and prosperity life coach and actor as well. And we're your co-host of Mindset Artistry YouTube channel, where we teach you the art of discovering and using your mindset to build a career and life you desire. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Mindset Artistry. We are so excited to have the lovely Erica S. Brain with us today. So a little bit about her before we get started. She started working in casting when she was 18 years old. And since then, she's worked on a ton of projects across all mediums, which shall remain nameless for right now. But you can check them out on the IMDb. Thank you to the strike. But she's amazing. <laughs> and she has also, which I can say, has cast 15 seasons of the prestigious Young Playwrights Festival for the Blank Theater Company. And yes. over the years, Bream's work in theater, short film, and television has gotten her nine RTOs nominations and a win in the Los Angeles Theater category, which is awesome. And I also want to add that she did create the hashtag casting loves you, which means everything to me because a lot of your posts have literally made me cry. <laughs> oh. Yes, so we're so from like, you know, speaking to many actors I've talked to, like, because we're always sharing your posts and everything. Oh, we have so many questions and we're so excited to have you here. But what really made you want to do that? Make that hashtag and just really start to educate us about, you know, what's behind the curtain because <laughs> it's traditionally very scary for a lot of actors. We're like, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well that, I mean, that's the point, right? It, and so casting is, um, has, has often had the finger pointed at them as, as the bad guy, right? And, and understand, right? I mean, understandably, right? We are, we are literally the step in between you and your dreams coming true. So I, I, I see why people are like, you, you're ruining it for me. And I get it. I like, I, like, you know, logically, I get it. Emotionally, it's very difficult, but logically, logically, I understand why, you know, casting directors tend to get a lot of flack from actors. Um, but I made the hashtag because I, I think it's it's so rare for you all to know and see just how much we advocate for you. I mean, you you interact with us in the audition process. I mean, with self-tapes, maybe not at all, but like that that's where we interact, right? But you don't see us talk about you constantly. We talk about you with your reps. We talk about you with our producers. We talk about you with our executives. We are re-editing your reels to get you a job. I've made art collages to get people jobs. I mean, like we are, we're doing all of these things that you don't see. And of course we do them because they are our job. And because of course we're passionate. And I, I, I think the actor, actors don't see that. They see a sort of an unfriendly person sitting across from them and they think, casting is the worst and they're a major hurdle I just have to get over but the reality is you truly can't be in casting if you don't love actors we spend our entire days looking at you talking about you advocating for you checking in on you I mean like entire day I spend more time looking at and talking to actors than I spend with my own family so so that is the thing that you you truly can't be in this craft if you don't love actors and we do and we can be cranky and unfriendly and worse um but nobody gets into casting for the hell of it <laughs> certainly not for the accolades or the money so it's that you know we're we're here because the people who we get to watch perform on a daily basis make us feel something and that is really really meaningful and we really do love actors so the hashtag came out about because I, I I talk to actors a lot and I hear a lot of their frustrations, including some of their very, very bad experiences with casting. And it was it was really a reminder that that the person on the other side of the internet, the person on the other side of, of your self-tape of your of the audition room, we are rooting for you, we are advocating for you, we celebrate you. Um, and we truly, truly, truly want you to succeed because when you succeed, we succeed. So that's where it was born. I love that. I love that. I was just having a moment. I was like, because they say like behind every great man is a great woman. I'm like behind every great actor, there's a casting director that saw them and just as great. I'm like, hello, great casting directors. That used right. to be a thing. Uh, yeah. I, I love everything about that. And it just brought me back to the fact that you actually during the pandemic, which I think is really cool because I participated and felt like I was still entrenched in my art during the pandemic that you did the O original challenge which was so 
cool. You had over 8,500 submissions. Yeah. Just, let me say like 8,500 <laughs> submissions that she went through and watched. Okay. Yeah. One. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so thank you for creating that. And again, thinking of us as, as creatives and a part of the industry and, and seeing us. Cause again, I think we feel like we're not seen all the time. We're dismissed, especially, you know, we go in the room and then we leave mm-hmm. and then we hear nothing. Whether you get it, like you get it. Yeah. You may not hear for three weeks, three months, half a year, who knows, or not at all. And so, I mean, yeah, listen, that the, those challenges. So, so I did, I think I want to say I did four self-tape challenges in the early pandemic. Um, that with the ending culminating with the original challenge, which was 8,500 people and that sort of cooked me, but, um, but they really, you know, that, that my very first one was like March 13th. That's when I released it. It was, it was like literally the day things started shutting down and I put it out in the world thinking like, I know actors are going to be freaking out. Let's just do something fun. But what I, what I experienced on my end is that it made me feel normal. It made me feel like the world was in crumbling. And and just to be completely um, honest and out there, I had just experienced a very, very tragic pregnancy loss in February of 2020. So I was deep in my grief and just starting to come out of it when the pandemic was starting to um, to come into, into full bear. Um, so the, that challenge was partly to distract me mm-hmm. from my feelings and my fears and my anxieties and my grief. And I did the first one. And I I think the first one, there was like 300 participants. The first one was just a, whatever, here's some size, everybody tape. And then I had people vote and I, I felt relieved um, to be able to participate in that from my end of things. It felt normal. It felt engaging. It felt creatively um, fulfilling. It was amazing. And it it was unquestionable. I finished that first challenge and was like, I'm going to do it again. I need more. I need more. I need more. <laughs> so I did, I did a kid's one. And then I did a monologue challenge um, mm-hmm. where a bunch of other casting directors took part in that as well. And we all picked our faves and we did generals with those people. And then came the original challenge. And I, I thought, the original challenge was just a little step that I was going to take on my way to my next challenge, which was going to be a one-liner thing. And because it, because the, the whole conceit of the original challenge was that people had to write their own stuff. And I was like, only some people are going to be into that. It's going to be like, it's going to be like 300 max for sure. And it was 8,500. <laughs> and I got the tapes in and I, I started going through them and I just remember being in awe because I really, I re- truly thought not that many people write, not that many people are going to want to do this. Um, and so many people did it and, and it was, the writing was great. It was, it was amazing. Some people are very funny. Uh, some people were deeply serious and I mean, just the stuff people were coming up with was, was really, really amazing. And I've had so many people since that challenge and that challenge, I think that challenge was released in like April of 2020 and I didn't finish it until mid June of 2020. Um, But I've had people reach out to me since then saying, I took the monologue that I wrote for your challenge and I created, I made it into a short film or I wrote the, a feature length based on it, or it inspired me to do this other thing that I wasn't, that I've always sort of been thinking about, but putting off. And it was, it was just, it was, it was deeply inspiring, but it was, it was a <laughs> hefty amount of work and um, maybe a, a six weeks or so into it. My husband was like, why don't you just pick a winner? Like, just, just, just pick, just pick, just be done. And I was like, I can't, I have to know what's in here. I have <laughs> to know what else is here. And I, I did, I went through all 8,500 tapes. And I had to narrow them down. And I I went, so I, I narrowed them from 8,500. Because I was trying to get to 10. There were two prompts. I was trying to get to 10 for each prompt. Um, and so I narrowed them down first to like 300 per prompt. And then again, I narrowed them down to like 50 per prompt. And I have I have these different categories where it's like final round one, final round two, finalists, you know, whatever. And um, I loved it. I loved it. I'm not going to do it again because I'm, 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 I'm cooked, but, um, but it was, it was a really great experience. It really was. I, I'm not sorry. I did it at all. Um, and it really, um, 
in, in the depth of the pandemic of the lockdown, it, it really made me feel normal. It was great. Mm. Well, thank you for being so vulnerable with us. And I know Amanda and I, you know, very sorry for your loss. Thank and, you. Thank you. And um, I think there's something really beautiful about that. A lot of times people think when they're doing something for others, serving other people, you're just helping someone else. But um, I grew up with a brother with autism. So it's always like helping that population. Everyone's like, oh, you're helping them. I'm like, oh, they help me, man. Like, right. just like, they remind me of like all the little genuine moments of life that we all forget. So I think that's yeah. so cool. And just like the monologue challenge, I didn't do that one, but I did a different one during the pandemic. And like, uh -huh. it, it, like you, cause I was like, I have to focus on something. My mom's like, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? What could you possibly be doing all day? I was like, what could you possibly be doing? I had to keep the, you know, but it, it was cool for me to see like so many people do one monologue. So it really taught me to just have bolder choices and let go. And I have yeah. a question about your like, like your co-star class and just because self-taping in general yeah it's like when that one self-tape comes down the pipeline every once in a while you're like oh and you have to like oh it has to be perfect on the step and co-stars can be so Amanda how many ways have you tried to like you know put on a co-star oh you know? oh so many and like, I'm sure like, there's not many, many more and it's exciting right. but it's also nerve-wracking at the same but time like the casting probably get the tapes like what are the <laughs> I can always try to send yeah. two takes you know <laughs> um, so I don't know, like if people take your co-star class, what is something that really stands out or things that we're doing that's funny? I don't know. The you know, co-stars are, the reason we teach that class is that co-stars are unquestionably some of the hardest roles that people audition for because they're deeply undefined. Um, you get like a half a beat to build an entire character um and and turn it into so you can can you make one line into a full scene I mean they're desperately challenging and of course you get to set and sometimes those are the roles where you have to talk to a wall right because by the time they get to your role the series regular is like I've been here 14 hours peace and you know they they're doing your coverage and you're talking to nobody I mean they're they're not easy um but as I always tell actors those roles are incredibly important. I mean, they wouldn't exist if they weren't important. And when they're done poorly, they stand out like a sore thumb at best, or they are edited out at worst, right? So um, with they, it's really important that we get them right. Um, and it, it can be incredibly tricky. And I've seen some really, really talented actors absolutely blow a co-star audition. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that that's what we teach it is, is just that there's, there are about a billion traps you can fall into with co-stars. Um, I mean, we could sit here and talk about it all day long, but there's, there's a billion and, um, and people do even the most, most, most seasoned actors do. And it's really hard to find that happy medium of making it interesting without doing too much. Because of course, with co-stars, it's not about you. You are serving the story, you're serving the joke, you're moving things along, you're providing information, all of that stuff. So threading that needle is, is quite difficult. Um, all of my classes are all audition technique based. Um, I'm not teaching Meisner, I'm not doing scene study, I'm doing very specific audition work. Because the, the work that you do on set is completely different. It's it's way easier to act on set when you got props and people yeah. and costumes and a director telling you what to do. And it's just like and, and you and you aren't worried about getting the job, right? Like it's it's a it's a completely different space. It's totally different um acting on stage. It's completely different acting for commercials. Like they're all so different. Um so that's my whole thing is that I want to empower actors to help them with the audition process because the audition process can be full of gray areas and the whole, you know, who's behind the curtain kind of thing and whatever. And um, my thing with these classes is that I want actors to walk away from them feeling like they know how to handle these challenges that come their way. Co-stars being a major challenge, but other challenges are like action roles you know you get a set of sides and it's like ha an entire page of stage directions and two lines um you know sandwich sandwiching that's the stage directions um you know stuff like that the the you know series regular roles seem easy in comparison to some of this stuff so 
So that's really the thing for me is that I, I want actors to know that when they walk into the door or when they step into their self-tape space, that they understand the task at hand. They understand they're not sitting there spiraling, thinking about, well, this or this or this or this or this, or maybe I should have, and then kicking themselves later, right? So that's really my, my big thing with all my classes that I just am trying to you know, remove some of the unknowns to help people up their confidence with the audition process. Yeah, I love that, removing the unknown. Because I know as actors, you know, mindset artistry is about the, the mindset of us, the mental health and yeah. this industry is so up and down, especially in today's world and what we're going through currently. Yeah. What is your advice for actors that are, you know, struggling or you know really having a hard time with finding themselves within the industry that is so unpredictable that is so unsure yet so exciting and you know collaborative i mean oh my gosh it is it's one of those things where like i could give you five different pieces of pieces of advice and they wouldn't even begin to scratch the surface right the 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 thing about being a, pro a professional film and television actor is that you are entering a very difficult industry. And I think if these strikes have taught us anything, it's how deeply complicated and not exactly cute um, our industry is. <laughs> oh, it's, not, it's not wonderful. Um, but we are here, all of us choose to be here because we love what we do, because we we love making art and it it is just so wonderful when people pay us to do that, right? So if, I mean, there are loads of ways for you to make art, loads of ways for you to act outside of the film and television industry. And you can absolutely go and do that. But if you're making the choice to be here, I think it's really important to understand that you are part of a much bigger picture. Um, for actors, this is one, one of the things I talk to actors about a lot, you know, the in the audition space, especially the self-tape space, right? When you're largely alone. Um, the audition is entirely about you, entirely about you. The scene is not. Even if you are the series regular, even if you're the lead, even if you are the titular lead, it's not about you. It's about this person who you're talking to. The only way it's entirely about you is if your character is looking into a mirror and they're by themselves right? That's it. So you are part of a bigger thing. You, in, in the art itself, you're part of a bigger thing. In this scheme of the industry, you are part of, you know, there are many hundreds of people, hundreds of people who work on any given film or TV project. So, so we are all truly, I mean, when we say that we're in this together, we truly are, we are connected. Um, this is why, you know, good work stands out, good behavior stands out, and the reverse, of course, is memorable too. Um, <laughs> um, but but that's why it's really important because at the end of the day, we want really fine artists on our sets, but we also want really good people on our sets. So so when you are thinking about your place in this industry, it's not just what you bring to the table. That is important, of course, because what you bring to the table is completely different than the next person. It's what makes you unique, but it's about how your uniqueness fits into this bigger puzzle. And if you can remember that you are you are part of this sort of global community, I think that will help just kind of maintain a little sanity around things like getting dropped by agents or rejection or things like that, because it feels so personal and so singular and it's not, it's wildly common. I mean, actors know that you hear no far more than you hear yes, right? So well, at the end of the day, only one person can get the job. So so there's there's that part of it, but the, you know, getting dropped by a rep or um, getting booked on a show and then getting fired after the table read, like they feel so personal. Like it's all about you. Like you have failed this thing and it's not, It's 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 a bigger picture thing. You know, when a rep drops you, it's a bigger picture thing. They don't think they can help you. They don't think they can make money off of you because maybe they have someone else on their roster who's taken up that space, um, you know, and they're they're trying to sort of cut you loose so you can go find the right person. You get fired after a table read, 
there's a bigger picture at play. There's also a billion people who weigh in about that. <laughs> and it only takes one at the very top to be like, I don't really like them for us to have to then scramble and replace you. So so again, all of that stuff, it it, it feels like it is entirely about you. Actors feel like this thing is on my shoulders. And we are, we're really, we're, we're connected. We're a team. Um, we all are, you know, especially all of us workers, the, the people on the ground making this stuff, the executives, you know, some of the creative executives are wonderful. The, you know, the, the casting executives and the development executives, they can be really, really great. You know, we'll, we'll leave the, the Zaslavs and the Igers and the Sarandos and, you know, we'll just leave, we'll just leave them over there in their corner to do whatever they do. But the, you know, the, the people we work with, at that level at the studio or network level they're really wonderful but they're not on the ground making the thing so you know we are we're 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 really united um and we are certainly um dependent on each other to 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 move forward in any in any event so when you're thinking about your mindset around being this actor in this somewhat overwhelming industry the thing you need to focus on is your uniqueness, how you can celebrate your uniqueness and how you can focus on the only things that are 100% within your control. There's two, your professionalism and your craft. That's it. Everything yeah. else is out of your control. Yeah. Thank you. No, I, felt, I felt that here. I felt that. <laughs> you know, like, oh, say that all the time, right? But yes. That's all we can control. That's all you could do. I mean, and I've been dropped by two agents. Amanda's been dropped by an agent. I've but been dropped too. I was like relating to that. And it was heartbreaking. I yeah. literally was yeah. on the, I cried so much. I was like, it's me. It. I'm horrible. I can't, I won't act anymore. And I was literally just so heartbroken. I kept asking like, why? Like, why? Like, what, what, yeah. what can I do? What can I do to like, for you not to drop me? And it was like, well, the, you know, the agent was leaving the industry and decided, and not everybody can take on all her clients. Their roster was already full. And I was like, right. are you sure? I was like, I was just so like, but no, there has to be a way. And it was like, no, there isn't. And this is when I, saying that everything happens for a reason, like you said, right around that time, my current manager happened to reach out to my agent interested in content working with me. And unbeknownst to me, I was like heartbroken. She said, actually, someone did reach out about you. And I was going to like not tell you, but you know, since everything happened, here's information. I met him and he's been my manager ever since. Amazing. And it was one of the best things and I would have never thought it would have been possible because in my mind I was going to start over sure. oh my gosh, it's, it was everything I remember I didn't have somebody for years because of the pandemic and then I just yeah. sent out all those emails and then my current manager and I've had multiple bookings at this point and they were like oh my gosh you're so amazing somebody's probably working with you I was like ha ha no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like please and so yeah it's cool I mean yeah. Listen, I know I know loads of really brilliant actors who are totally unrepresented. Not yeah. by choice, but because they fell into the into the cracks, the purgatory of being between reps. And it just it just sort of went on and on and they can't claw their way out. I worked with an actor once. I mean, she, she her rep story is ridiculous. She like had everything bad, every bad thing happened where like she signed with an agent, then they switched departments and that, you know, like all of these things, right? And went on for like seven years and she finally she finally got an agent who was who was genuinely stoked about her and that girl booked two jobs in the first month of being with that agent yeah and that's the thing is that like you know listen it, I, I mean everything happens for a reason which i know is the like the most annoying adage in the world but it's true right like the like it, it really is true i mean the the thing that um, my friend Kara always says rejection is divine protection, right? So you get rejected by this one person and maybe it's because ultimately that rep was not the right rep for you. They weren't going to grow with them. And now instead this door has opened for you to be with this manager and the doors are opening again, you know? So you just never know. I mean, listen, I have talked to so many sweet, wonderful actors who have come to me crying because they have been dropped by their rep and they think they're never going to act again. And it must be because they're terrible. And, you know, it feels deeply, deeply personal. 
It totally does. But at the end of the day, it's business. <laughs> it's hard to grapple that concept. And Janelle and I talk about that a lot, that it is a business. And if you yeah. love it, then you're going to continue to do it regardless of the rejection because you actually have the passion for it. And I know you have a passion for this industry and apparently a secret passion for portrait photography. So I want to- yeah. Oh, oh, look at that. <laughs> That's so exciting. She's like, I do. Yes. It's, it's so funny because uh, during the pandemic around that time, I'm like, my mom had gotten me a camera and I was just uh -huh. like randomly taking pictures of like plants and animals. And that was just like a thing. Like, I don't want people. I just wanted plants and animals and like show sure. me closer and all that stuff. So I love that you have a passion for it because no one really knows that about me. I just kind of do it and like keep it like it's yeah. my little precious precious little like sick house that I want to keep to myself. But tell me about like your passion in portrait photography and how that has tied into you being a casting director and looking at headshots and going, this doesn't fit you very well. Maybe you want to get a headshot that shows the world of what you're trying to be casted in and things like that. I mean, listen, if there was a job that was just headshot consultant, I'd like sign me up. Okay. <laughs> I, I I love it. It is, it is, <laughs> it is now my not so secret passion. Um, but I, I, I do, I'm, I'm wild about it. So my, my dad's a professional photographer. When I was growing up, he was, he was a hobbyist photographer, but he always had a camera in his hand. He always had a camera in our faces, of course. Um, cause that's what parents do, but especially parents who have cameras. Um, and so when I was, uh, I was probably seven. For my birthday, he got me this DSLR camera. I mean, then it was a, you know, it was film. So it wasn't, I just remember that the sound of that shutter was so loud. It was like, it was like, <laughs> this, like crazy loud shutter. But, um, but I had this like big honking camera. It was a, it was a Canon Rebel. I don't remember exactly um, when I was, when I was seven and um, we would go out and we would take pictures and he would help me with composition and stuff like that. And so I, I just kind of always, I, I hate the math of professional photography. I'm not going to be a professional photographer. I hate to learn. I like, I don't want to learn F styles. I don't want to learn the editing. I just, I just want, I want to frame the photograph and have it be the way I want it to look, you know, it's, 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 it's silly, but, um, but I, uh, I, I, I do love, I love composition. Um, and so I, I always had a, a relatively large camera in my hand growing up. Um, and I, uh, I started doing theater when I was like, I was in fifth grade. I think I was doing, I was, I started in fifth grade. I did, um, a, my community theater production of Annie, um, uh, which was absolutely delightful. Cool. Oh my God, it's so good. It's so good. It's long, like my, it was my favorite musical since I was two and I got, they came, you know, announced the community production and I was like, can I be in it? And that was, that was my first, that was my first show. But, um, at that show backstage, um, I took a portrait of the woman who played Miss Hannigan. And of course she, you know, had all this crazy ass stage makeup on. Um, and we, this was on film course because I'm that old and we had to get it developed and we got it back and um I pulled it out and it this is a really good photo and I was you know 11 or something like that and I showed it to my dad and he was like uh wow okay uh what do you think about entering it in the state fair and I was like sure what does that mean uh, I didn't you know I didn't know um so they blew it up and my dad had it framed and they entered it in this, I guess it was the county. It wasn't the state fair. Let's be real. The, the, this was not a statewide thing. This was in my county. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, we entered it in the county fair and it won first prize. Um, and I think the, that it just kind of proved to me that like when I'm looking at faces, I know what I'm looking for. Like I, that, that's my thing is that um, some people love taking pictures of flowers. My dad loves taking pictures of flowers. Um, some people will spend all day taking pictures of their dogs. My husband takes pictures of our kids ad nauseum. Um, and I like sitting somebody down and finding the angle of their face that I want to tell a story with. Um, so that's, that, that's where my passion comes from. Um, and then of course, I stare at faces all day long um and with headshots they run the gamut of not great to exceptional right um and seeing how they change seeing how trends change them um 
seeing the different styles within a single actor's profile. Like I just, I just find it absolutely fascinating. So I, I have a lot of opinions about it and I do career consultations and a lot of people will come and they will ask me about their materials in general. And I, I could truly spend all day talking about headshots and what I think they should have versus what they have. Um, some people do have some great headshots already. And I, you know, don't, I'm like, these are amazing. Um, sometimes they come to me and I validate their instinct that is different than what their agents said. And I'm like, this picture, this one should be your default. And they're like, oh, that's what I think too, but my agent hates it. Um, but it's tricky because agent, uh, agents, headshots, agents too a little bit, but headshots are in, com, incredibly subjective, right? What I feel about a headshot is not going to be what the next cast director feels about it. So that's where it gets a little bit, a little bit difficult, but um, yeah, I have a lot of opinions about it. I have a lot of opinions <laughs> and uh, I am becoming more and more vocal about those opinions. So if there, if, if I someday create a headshot consultant career, don't be surprised. <laughs> I, I love it or go to a gallery you can have your own gallery and just have a little, I mean, like blown up headshots and just I'll go and sip my little champagne I'm like yes that's right. I would so love that I had a thought actually now that you were talking about like agents and they're going you know I don't like the headshot but I do as like actor because I know and I've heard it before and I've also been in this position where we feel insecure about advocating for ourselves with our representation Yep. And it can be really like, oh, I don't want to get the other, on their bad side. I don't yep. want to say no. I, 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 I don't, I told them that I don't want to do like, I don't know, nudity, but they keep sending me stuff and saying that I got that. Like, how do you express and advocate for yourself with your representation? What is your advice for the actors out there who are kind of teetering that? So with headshots, what I usually tell my actors that I consult with is that with headshots, right? Because it's again super subjective. Um, what you can say is say, I hear you. I'd really like to try this headshot for a couple months and see if it moves the needle. So I'm gonna make this my default for the next three months. But if it doesn't work, we'll go back to the one you like. So again, it's team, but it's also you are saying we're doing this. And then I am completely open to to doing it your way if it just ultimately doesn't work. Um, so, so that way you can sort of be on the same team, but you can also make sure that your voice is being heard. Um, but advocating for yourself in general with your reps is really important. And I think this is where sometimes actors find that they are in not great rep relationships for far too long because they're afraid to leave that kind of relationship, but those are your boundaries, right? So nudity, things like nudity, um, so, I, I mean, I I've, I discovered recently because I was I was casting a show about demons that there is a whole group of people that are will absolutely not play a possessed character. Um, there you go. See, there you go. Two right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they're like, 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 right like, now thinking about so it. Yeah, it's like a hard so, line for some people. Yeah, and I, I had no idea. I had, I had absolutely no idea. I just you know the, when you cast a lot of sci-fi, you just assume that everybody loves to play the weird shit. Um, but it's it's not true. Some people are like, uh, no, I'm not doing that. I'm definitely not doing that. Um, so I learned that recently. And again, that these these are your boundaries. This is like. I, I'm not going to play a possessed character. I'm not going to do full frontal nudity. I'm not going to do a sex scene that feels um, like, like with a with a gender that I feel uncomfortable with. Um, I'm not going to play a culturally written character that is not that doesn't align with who I am. Um, you know, whatever. There there are hard boundaries, and if your reps aren't listening to those things. Those are the important things. This is, we're not talking about like the difference between not going out for guest stars anymore or not going out for co-stars anymore. I mean, right? Like that's that's a that's a career growth thing. This is a this is a personal boundary. And I think if you are in a relationship with somebody who continually um, disregards that boundary, you need to do you need to do two things. One, have a clear conversation and just say, listen this is this is very very real for me i will not cross this boundary if you continue to send them to me i'm going to continue to pass and i know that's not a great look and you don't like me to do that so going forward i just want to make sure that we are not doing the, these particular types of auditions um and if they don't listen to that stuff or they push back on you and they say 
you know, but you really need to do this for the growth of your career. That's not the right person for you. And it's really hard to sort of look that moment in the eye and be like, okay, you're not the right person for me. It's terrifying. I know. I mean, we just talked about getting dropped and how awful it can be. It's the same thing. If you are the dropper, by the way, um, but ultimately you're going to continue to be in a difficult position with that person. Do you want that? Do you want to feel anxiety every time you get an email from them or a text? Do you want to feel bullied by them? Mm. I mean, that's, it's tough. So you want to make sure that you are with a rep ultimately who gets you, but also respects those boundaries. Um, and it may not be the person you're with now, and it may not ultimately be the size of the agency or management company that you want to be with. But if that's the person for you, that is going to be the way forward for you. I think a lot of people stay with in toxic um, rep relationships mm -hmm. because of the reputation of the agency or the management company. And I mean, do you, how do you want to feel when your phone rings and it's your agent? Do you want to feel like you're going to vomit? Do you want to feel like, how do you want to feel? So, so that is, you know, something to, to sort of look in the eye. I've, I've, again, in consultation, I have a lot of actors who come to me and they're like, so this red flag and this red flag and this red flag and this red flag. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, so what do you think about that? And they're like, yeah, I don't know. And it's hard. It's a really hard pill to swallow to like, to, to, look that moment in the, in the eye and be like this person who I worked so hard to get to sign me is not the right person for me. But if they're, if they're pushing you on, on major moral boundaries, that's a, that's a problem. Yeah. And that's like, you know, that's like what we were talking about when I was dropped. I mean, Amanda knows I'm stubborn. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> kind of like that thing. She was very like, you know, didn't like theater. Um, and then get mad at me, even if I was doing like a four to six week run, I was like, theater's my gym, dude. Um, and then also just like, I don't know, one time I got sick and I couldn't go to a casting and she like berated me for like 20 minutes about how I'm so lucky that, you know, I was like, I don't want to get casting sick. Um, but you know, this is, <laughs> but speaking of like boundaries and relationships, this is something like, you know, Amanda and I talk about all the time. Cause like, I'm getting better, but networking used to scare me so bad, especially because the way I was oh. raised. My mother, she would be like, listen, like you don't call people at certain times, but it's weird. So like my dad was a journalist. So we're doing this podcast thing. You know, normally Erica, I'd be so afraid to reach out to you, but I was like, hey, you want to come on our podcast? Like there's not even, <laughs> <laughs> but for like, if I'm like acting, I'm like, no, I want to be an actor. Can I talk to you? Like it's, <laughs> Right. <laughs> the podcast yeah. is just so like, oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> so totally. I don't know like what advice you have for actors that are kind of because it's like you need to know we exist, but we don't want to be annoying. But oh, like man, the, the networking thing. I mean, listen, I, I have discovered, by the way, as I age, I get more and more introverted. Um, I went to a an industry thing a couple months ago and I lasted 30 minutes before I left. 30 oh. minutes. And I left and I went and I, as I was spending, I was staying with my, my best friend from college and I went and I got into my sweatpants and we had tacos and margaritas. And I was like, this is where I need to be. Uh, it was amazing. So, I mean, I, some people are just effortless at networking staff. They're effortless and like, God bless those people. God bless them. But we shouldn't all set their standard as our standard. <laughs> Um, networking looks, however it looks for you and your personality. Um, there's no right way to do it. N you know, networking with cast and directors is not how you get us to remember you. We remember you by the work that you do. That's how we remember you. We remember the amazing you know, audition that you did that we can't forget. There's this one, there's this one young actor. I, I recently cast this movie and this movie is so special. The script is just, ugh. And I, and the writer director was amazing. And the whole experience was just so dreamy. It was so dreamy. And, um, you know, you know, a movie's going to be, or a project's going to be really good when you start to look at auditions and everybody is nailing it. Everybody is. That's how good the writing is. Right. So I'm casting this role and I can't remember the last time that I saw so many 
fan fucking tastic auditions in a row. And but there was one in particular that was so endearing and I will never forget it. That guy didn't get cast, but I I, I can see his face. I can see it. I will never forget it. And and so that's that is the thing that you have to remember is is that it's not how boisterous you are at any given networking event. It's not how adorably styled you are. It it truly is the work. Um, you know, if you are are looking to meet a, a writer, director, whatever, you know, obviously those people don't always see your work as much as we do. Um, so networking with them might look like being a dog walker for them or you know like right right now you go out on the picket line and as you're walking in circles you start talking with somebody and you you know spark a, a brief friendship that where you at least exchange names um that's fine that's fine it doesn't have to be a full-throated effort every time um it doesn't have to be email blasts every six months it doesn't have to be that stuff it's whatever works for you and your personality. I always tell actors, you know, they're like, how do we follow up? How do we follow up? And I'm like, how do you like to communicate with people? Do you like to handwrite notes? Do you like to email? Do you like to, are you a social media person? Like how, how, how do you like to do that? Um, Cause just, there's no right way to do it. So, so that's what I always try to remind people of is that whatever way suits you and your personality, that is the way that you should make relationships. It's not, you don't, you don't even use the word networking, which is just so triggering, right? <laughs> but like, um, you, you know, how do you make relationships? How do you, how do you forge these things? How do you remember people you come into contact with? So, so that's, that's what you want to think about when you're thinking about your um, business relationships and, and moving those things forward in the industry. That's great advice. That's definitely great advice because I know, at some point earlier on, I remember having a, a business class that was teaching me about, you know, just the acting industry. And they were like, you need to do the newsletters, or at the time, the postcards, you know, every time you book something, say something interesting. And so I even got overwhelmed by doing it because I was like, eh, it, what, how often? I got to track this. At, when did it, what, act, what casting director did I send it to? What booking did I send it to? And it just got so overwhelming that it kind of took the fun out of it. A bit. Yeah, it's it's of it yeah. And so I appreciate you saying that. Obviously, the world has changed now. Most people are in are not in offices anymore. They're right. are all over the world. And so now it's like, what do we use? Social media, email, or things like yeah. that. Or like online workshops and classes yeah. that you do. And so I appreciate that. And it's like, just stay true to yourself. I always say, you know, when you find that inner voice and your authenticity, the work follows. The work comes with you. You know, and if you're putting that into your art, you know, like you said, for the self tape, like you saw him in that particular tape, you saw him uh, like you, behind the eyes, like you, you're like, oh, I, you know what? It may not be this role, but the next one and the next one, and I'll keep bringing you in until the day that you book and like, you know, and so I love that again, and I hope everybody out there who may feel like casting are casting directors are not for us, they're actually they are. They are our biggest fans. They are our biggest advocates and they are rooting for you always. Um, yeah. And yeah, and, and I love that you offer all these amazing classes that are so affordable as well, especially in today's, you know, challenges. So <laughs> <laughs> did this just come about or did you see that there was like a gap missing in the industry that you wanted to go, you know what, I can serve the industry a bit more. And I want to because you obviously you have a passion and joy for this. So they're, you know, my, my normal classes, my normal audition technique classes, they're, they're expensive. Um, and, and I have worked to get them to that place by refining my syllabus, refine, you know, making sure that, that what an actor pays, they're getting a lot for, for that, um, that payment. So I, I really, you know, work hard at these classes. I put my full heart into them. I, you know, find new material. I make sure I to change up syllabus, you know, all of that stuff. But they're expensive. And as we were sort of inching closer and closer to May 1st, when the writers first called their strike, I could tell that, you know, the work had already been dwindling, right? And um, I could tell that people were kind of sa saving their coins. They didn't know what was going to happen. And I thought, why offer expensive stuff right now 
you know, if, if, if truly I want to show up for this community, make it affordable. So I just decided, I was like, screw it. We're going to do $10 classes. I'm going to talk at you for an hour and, and that's what we'll do. Um, here's a range of topics. So we're going to donate a portion of this to the entertainment community fund so that it's meaningful beyond what we're doing here. Um, and then, and just recently, um, I teach, I co-teach a lot with Karashoot Rosenbaum and we took a bunch of our classes that we, we tend to co-teach together and we've started truncating those to make them more affordable. So we're taking our longer form classes, our four week classes, et cetera, and making them like two exercises instead of four and, you know, just trying to provide some affordable options for people who want to stretch their muscles, people who do want more than just a lecture series. Um, they want to have actual practice, but you know, uh, the, the climate right now in the industry is that it's difficult. You know, I, I worked by, I, I got, didn't just work. I got paid <laughs> for five weeks of casting this year since January. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe more than some of my peers. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the thing is that like, everybody's struggling. We're, we're all feeling it. We're all, we're all feeling it. And I think to, to only have my sort of pricier classes available, just, it's, it's, it's just not right in the room, you know? So, um, so that's, that's sort of my thing right now is just opening this up. Let's, let's give access as much as possible, you know, feed people's creative hearts. I'm not going to do a self tape challenge. So <laughs> let's do this instead. Um, just to, you know, answer the, the questions that I get so frequently talk about some of the things that I do talk about in some of my longer form classes and then go about our merry ways and, you know, just do that, do that for a while. So I don't know. I, the, the, they, um, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can come up with new topics. Cause I think some people are, are burning out on some of the old ones. Um, I'm trying to keep them available as long as SAG is on strike. Although it's going on longer than I had hoped. So, you know, I, I thought I had a, a fair number of topics, but I feel like I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to dig back into the, uh, old bookcase and see what else is in there to keep it going throughout this strike. <laughs> um, I have one. I'm sure there's many, many topics. I, know, I have here. an idea. I, well, because I was just filming. I, I just filmed a film in Austin because I had the intermittent agreement. Yeah. It's one of those things where we had, I had to cry for four hours, basically. <laughs> and <laughs> I was rediscovering that script. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I'm just, or like, you know, one point I felt judged by the crew and I used that, my like insecure, whatever. But I think actors can, like, you're like it's crazy because you're like on this set and you're supposed to have this crazy emotional thing. And then like, like all the crew is hilarious and they're like cracking jokes right behind your sure. head. And you're just like, like trying. To <laughs> so that would definitely be something. I got through it and I was like, well, you know, I think I definitely killed it. But I was like, I got it. This is something that should be taught more, I think. How to cry for five hours straight. Yeah, because, you know, you're connected to the material, but you're also human and just finding. Oh, man, I hope you got a really good nap after that. I just, like, sat in my hotel room, like. <laughs> Dehydrated. Yes, 107 <laughs> degrees. They'd be chain smoking herbal cigarettes and, like, stopping my daughter from having an abortion. Like, it was, like, the constant. <laughs> wow. Hotel, yeah. Yeah, gotta love the art. Yeah, yeah. And and so I love that because I was thinking of my brain is always going to as we're both Aries, Janelle and I. So we're like, what? All these things. It's great. Uh, I was thinking you spoke about like action and different types of self tapes that we have to do as actors. You know, I always. I'm curious because I think some casting directors have like don't use props, but you can use min minimal props or, you know, the actions of like if you get shot, like I remember having an audition earlier on where I had to get shot in the middle of an elevator and they were like, we want to see that. I was like, how the heck do I do that? Do I do the whole like, Ugh! like, you know, I, I didn't know that like splat to the wall. Like I didn't know, <laughs> you know, so I was like, what do I do? And so what's your advice for it? Obviously, since then, I've been to many classes. And, and learned 
But what is your advice for actors who may be like overthinking these little nuances in between or these stage directions that tell you to do very specific, specific things like cry on the cue and they laugh here and they turn around and, you know, all these like very meticulous things that are put in this in two pages that we yeah. feel like we have to nail from start to end. I mean, if you talk to the the average writer, I mean, there's an exception to this, and I'm sure we are all aware of who these people are. But um, if you talk to the average writer, they would be horrified to think that they were painting an actor into a performance corner with their with their writing. Um, they have to spell that out in the script. They have to. There are so many people that have to read that script and understand the vision. <laughs> So, so it exists there for a very specific purpose, but it's not to, to handcuff the performer. Um, and in fact, in my experience, most writers, um, they, they tend to gravitate toward the actor who doesn't follow those exact things. They use that stuff as information. Um, they don't ignore it. You know, they're not just like, there's no context here, you know, forget the, forget the daughter abortion thing, you know, whatever they're, they're not like throwing things away, but they aren't marrying themselves to the exactness of it. Um, and that I think is one of the things, cause, cause actors, actors are such good rule followers. You're such good rule followers. You're told to follow rules early on in your career, follow the rules, the word, the, the, the script is the law, like, you know, all of this stuff. And, and, Yes, to a certain extent, but not when it comes to an interpretation of somebody else's vision, right? So so that's the thing that um, I would try to remind actors of is that the way if you can if you can read through that that stuff, you know, the stage direction that tells you when to cry or the stage the, the getting shot in the elevator or you know whatever, and you can mine out some intention behind it, some um, some uh, emotional things that you can connect to, that is going to be interesting and still appropriate, still honoring what's on the page. Um, but if you are marrying yourself to this exact moment that you're supposed to cry or this exact way that you're supposed to get shot or whatever, you're going to be in your head about whether or not you've achieved that. Um, you're also, your tape is going to be identical to the next person who also follow those roles. So I, I once cast a role, it was a really difficult role. It was a, a female, a young female lead. She was written to be 18 years old. So we were, we were reading like 17 to 20 year olds for this role. And it, it was it was a dark role. And the, the first scene was her in therapy, um, screaming at her therapist. And um, these young women who, of course, when you are 17, 18, you have a limited life experience, right? <laughs> Compared to say a 30 year old or older um and they're they're doing the scene and in the scene of course it says she screams she cries you know it tells the actor how to what what this character is going through and um some of these young women they didn't do anything wrong they just did exactly what was on the page and they were completely different human beings and their tapes were identical so that is, that's what you have to remember is that that stuff is not meant for you to marry yourself to. Again, there are certain people who want you to marry yourself to it, but we all know who those people are. Um, the, <laughs> but um, it's it's really because that writer has to provide a wider vision to a lot of people. So don't ignore it. Mine out the information, look for intention, look for context, look for relationship clues, get all the yummy stuff that you need from, from that stuff. And then bring your version to life. That's what we want to see. We want to see that the reason we ask for you to audition for this thing instead of this other person is, is because we're interested in your point of view. We're interested in how, what you're going to do with this, not how well you follow directions and follow directions but like you know <laughs> in, in other areas more than 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 in the performance <laughs> yes especially if, you, if casting gives directions about do horizontal or you know follow those yeah, right right logistical directions sure yes sure, totally <laughs> but you know interpretive artistic directions like we're, we're truly looking for your point of view we're looking for your take on it so so it's not that you are 
you know, thwarting or, or absolutely, you know, brushing aside the writer's intention or the tone of the piece or anything like that. You are simply bringing your sensibilities to this thing and interpreting this in your way. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I hope everyone's taking that and not putting it from one ear to the other, like take it, keep it, hold it tight and remember that. Um, it's hard it, to it, trust it. I think that's, that's the big thing is that like, you can know that as an actor, but then also as an actor, you're like, I gotta follow the rules. It tells me to cry here. So that's why I should cry. Yeah, it's a fear. It's a major fear of like, can I give myself the freedom to like, well, I don't, I'm not feeling the cry right now. Maybe I'm feeling a little angry at this particular moment. Yeah. Yeah. As human beings, like I know I cry sometimes when I'm mad, but it's just yeah. like I'm literally holding, I'm like, cool, chill, calm down, we're going to cry. But it's not because I'm sad. It's just like, this is one way that I'm expressing this emotion. I accidentally I add humor. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, my mom, <laughs> cries, my mom laughs when she's like really nervous. Like most of the stuff I've booked, like not even like a super deep crying thing, but like it makes sense within the context of the scene. Yeah. I'm a yeah. Cool ball and then you know we actually don't have there's been time we haven't even used it when we film but they were like, the we're that, like we like you right you know? and that's the thing is like it's so honest yes so so you know we that that is what we gravitate toward yeah Ooh, so many so many ways we can go and i'm so excited i can keep you on here forever sorry <laughs> i because i saw that you're a very happy person and we're like very happy people we really try to really create mindset artistry to be a community for us because I feel that during the pandemic we had lacked that and yeah. so this is where it kind of came about and so I love that you have done that in your unique way as being a casting director and being in the industry since you were 18. 18. Yeah. Now that, yeah. that's a passion for something to keep in it. How do you continue to find the joy and happiness in it with ever the, so much uncertainty and I think this can also translate to other you know actors and and th their mindset. I mean, listen, it's not easy. I, you know, I get crispy every couple of years and I'm like, screw this. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to go do this other career, you know, whatever. It's, it's hard. It's, it's a, it's a fair. <laughs> um, but one of the reasons that, that one of the things that does keep me in this industry is that young playwrights festival that I've done 15 seasons of. Um, it is one of the most gratifying projects that I work on and I get to do it annually. Um, and it, it's, it's fabulous. I, it's so creative. It's so emotionally fulfilling. All the playwrights are kids. It is, it is a deeply artistically and emotionally important experience. And, and if I, if I didn't have it annually, I might be a different person, but, um, I've had it 15, 15 years in a row. So, so that is definitely a, a big piece of who I am, but you need to have that thing. You need to have that thing in your life that reminds you why you chose to enter this insane industry. Um, and for me, I got into, I got into all this cause I loved theater. And so the, of course, the thing that sort of reminds me why I still love to do it is theater. Um, so, so you need to have that thing. You need to have the, the person who motivates you or the type of art that motivates you or the type of class that really makes you feel like, yes, this is where I want to be. You need to have, you need to know what that, what, what will relight your fire because it's really easy for, for you to burn out. It's really easy. Um, I've burned out multiple times in this industry. <laughs> Um, I, I've started taking biology classes to go do other things. I mean, truly, I've, I, you know, we've all been there. So, um, so, so, but you have to have the people, the community are all of that's going to get you through the, the, you know, the day to day, but you need to have the thing that is going, that is going to sort of relight your flame when it feels like it has totally gone out. And not everybody knows what that is immediately off the top of their head. Um, I'm really lucky that I, I know exactly what it is and I know exactly when it's going to show up every year. Um, so, you know, there's, we, we've all need to have, have that we, uh, Karen. So Karen, and I co-cast the Young Playwrights Festival together and we used to call it the palate cleanser because it always came right after pilot season, network pilot season and network pilot season can be a, a real bear. Um, and to go from that where you're dealing with all kinds of insanity and politics and, you know, just insane hours to this very, very, um, you know, pure 
experience was always like a palate cleanser. So what do you have for, for yourself that is going to remind you why you chose this? That's, that's, that's something like that, the palate cleanser. I'm going to use that, Erica. Yeah, take the it. palate cleanser. Use it. Like or the that. movies. That's what I do. <laughs> there you I go. go. The big Absolutely. theater and I watch it and then I'm like, am I done yet? No. And then I like, <laughs> almost knocked me out the last time we went to, we got, what was it, a box? Oh, all right. All um, right. Okay. I want to kick boxing classes and, and I'm a little the bit box. rough. I think you'll actually have to hit me. It was an accident. We watched the Michael B. Jordan, um, what was it? The the, the boxy movie. Creed. Creed, yes. The yeah. recent one. And we were trying to do like an Instagram social media content skit. And we were, you know, trying to go like we were the two battling. And by accident, I went this way. And she, you walked into it, girl. I just walked into it. You walked into it. You are a walking skit. That's what you and I are. <laughs> uh-huh. I was, uh, thank goodness it was nobody on the street, but just her and I. And we have it recorded and it's just like really fun, but that's what we do. We like to, I've done that so many times. And I think one of the in- reasons why I joined the industry was because I love storytelling. And also I had such a thing about animation growing up. Like cartoons yeah. were just yeah. my, they were my thing. I, I yeah. imagined myself in it. So I always yeah. go back to that and it's always been like my dream. I'm like, yeah, one day I'm going to have my version of like Toy Story, like franchise. It's just, Amazing. I had my Woody with the with the Amanda on the foot. Like it just, to me, it brought back like that inner child having so much fun and like this fantastical aspect as human beings, we, we can do all these amazing things. Totally. And yeah, so it's just, so remember everybody, clean, a palate cleanser, stay true to yourself throughout this industry advocate for yourself always yeah and know that casting directors and casting loves you that is like ultimately casting loves you and they are rooting for you if not now there will be a day that they will remember that amazing audition that you did that you put in work and they go i got it i got it this is the one for her this is the one for them this is the one for him all of that and i i think this is i hope Someone takes something from this because I took a whole lot of gems from here. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for responding to us and like agreeing to be it on. You know, we friend. never know. We're like, Get, are you going to come on? You know, we, we just want to have fun and, and talk. Like, well, you know, thank, thank you for having me. I appreciate you, you ladies. I love that you are focused on mindset i think it's so important for actors because it's it's just real easy to let all the voices tear you down so you know to 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 let that be the primary focus of what you two are doing is huge so thank you very much thank you thank you very much and just lastly because i'm sure everyone's going to be curious what's the best way to keep in contact with you i know that you said like social media very heavy on that but what do you feel comfortable with so yeah, social media is fine. Um, Instagram is sort of my primary at this point. Um, I am on ugh, all of them except for Facebook <laughs> at this point. Uh, there is the same handle everywhere. It's Erica S. Breamcast on Twitter, on Blue Sky, on TikTok, uh, and uh, on Instagram. Uh, but really, Instagram is the only one that I'm on threads. Uh, Instagram is really the one that I'm I'm active on. I would, uh, Twitter is just a sad, sad, terrible place. And Blue Sky is not really anything. And Threads is really just Instagram. So, um, you know, I, I'm on, and find me on Instagram. Um, I'm also, uh, you can find me through my website, um, which is ericasbreamcasting.com. Yes. And check her out. She has all these amazing classes and workshops. So, and she's always there for a consultation. So take it and go with it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see. See you guys next time for the next episode of Mindset Artistry. Thanks. What are your thoughts about this episode? Drop it in the comments and let us know what you want to dive into next. Subscribe, like, share, and click the link below to book a free consultation. And we'll we'll see see you you next time. time.